Beethoven was 30 when he announced himself first as a symphony composer in a concert in Vienna where he'd lived for the last eight years. He'd written so much already. I mean, he'd written two piano concertos, he'd written the Opus 18 string quartets, he'd written God knows how many uh, piano sonatas, and I think he just really wanted to show his personality and his, his innate sense of drama and his innate sense of structure and form uh, in a symphonic context. And he did it in an extraordinary way because he starts off with shock tactics. He starts off with the dominant seventh of an unrelated key to C major, which is his main key. So it's, it's, it's gruff, it's blunt. And then he develops this slow introduction. Um, and it's only really about halfway through that you realize actually we're heading for C major. <laughs> There's an enormous amount of originality already in this music, in the way it develops, in the use of instruments. I mean, he is using woodwind instruments in dialogue with the strings in a very brilliant way. And he has a, a, a peculiar way, which I find very, very endearing, of fragmenting a musical melody and the different segments are distributed to, to the individual woodwind instruments. So it becomes conversational. And there's a wonderful moment right at the end of the introduction where he tips a whole lot of semiquavers um, in all the stringed instruments, really like a bird of prey swooping down on an unfortunate mouse. Yeah. When Beethoven arrived in Vienna, he was uh, very much a Rhinelander. He, you know, he'd been born in Bonn. He didn't have a Viennese accent, and uh, he was kind of treated with uh, respect for his obvious uh, gifts as an improviser and as a formidable p uh, pianist, um, and only slowly as a composer. And the Viennese audience then, as now, are quite conventional. They were a middle-class audience with aristocrats peppered amongst them. But the thing about Beethoven is that unlike Haydn, who was an employee of the Esterhazy family for most of his life, Beethoven is a freelancer. He's going it alone and he wants to establish his personality, his, his, his credentials straight, straight away. And this is the arena in which he can do it. It's in Vienna, and it's in the symphony, because the symphony is a public statement. It's, it's a, a statement um, that he can make about his most personal philosophical ideas. And one has to remember that he's living at an incredibly crucial moment in, in the evolution of, of European history, in the sense that, you know, we're only a few years after the French Revolution and uh, the reign of terror, and also the rise to power of Napoleon Bonaparte. Things are changing rapidly. It all calms down post-Napoleon, post-Congress of Vienna, but here everything is abuzz and alive. Even though there's not a literal kind of transformation of um, a political idea or, or a philosophical idea made into music, made into notes, it's lurking in the background and one realizes this man is not just providing entertainment music, he's providing polemics. Imagine a very smelly tramp walking into a beautiful 18th century drawing room. That's probably what he looked like. And, and he's trying to be good-mannered. Oh, 
and he sort of is, but it's a bit smelly, that's all. <laughs> Beethoven's debt to both Mozart and Haydn in different ways is manifest and you can hear it right the way through this opening symphony. What makes it sound so individual, so idiosyncratic, is these sudden uh, juxtapositions of almost violent, outraged music and then music of brilliance and then lyrical passages. <laughs> I don't think Haydn or Mozart have done that. It's something that Mozart, of course, did, and Haydn did in his way, but they structured it differently. Beethoven does it by taking you by the scruff of the neck. And he also uses the word, or the musical indication, sforzato, an awful lot, much more than Mozart or Haydn. And sforzato really means an accent that's really going to be harsh. There is a hard edge to his uh, musical discourse but he's also capable of incredible warmth and beautiful melodic and lyricism. So it's, it's not just simply the sort of um, frowning Beethoven that one hears in the first symphony, one hears a good deal of charm and elegance as well. I love the way you play that, it's really good. Good. Upbeat anacrusis. Got him out. Dance. There's one movement when he really, really shows that he's a, a radical spirit. That's the so-called minuet. I mean, he calls it a minuet, and that's what Mozart and Haydn would have called the third movement, which is meant to be playful and almost a kind of intermezzo between the more serious slow movement and then the epic finale that brings everything together. If you played it as a minuet, it would be really, really pedestrian. Boom, beam, boom, 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 boom. And then dum dee dum da da dum bum bum ba dum bum I mean, any baby could have written that. It, 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 and it's very, very banal. But what he does is to write over it allegro molto e vivace. That means damn fast, which nobody in Mozart and Haydn's time would have done. So it goes ding ding bum 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 bum. And, and from the moment that supercharged energy and, and swiftness of tempo happens, you realize that you're dealing with a totally different type of musical animal.
And then the last movement is, is, is something completely different. I mean, it's, it's, it's Beethoven saying, look, Haydn, Papa Haydn was a very, very witty composer. I have a sense of humor, maybe a Rhinelander type of humor, and I usually like to have a beer in my hand, but I'm going to tease you. And he does tease you. He starts off with a big G major chord, and then he just lifts the, leaves the first violinist just to go, team, ba bum ba bum ba bum ba ba bum bum bi ba 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 bi and then a little filigree da da dee 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 and when he arrives there you think well what on earth is going to follow and he goes and he does this sort of tremendously energetic um, and playful scalistic statement of a theme in, in, in the first violins and it's it's valiant and it's effusive and it's it's very original, beautiful, wonderful music.